list with me. Um, if you have not looked at the list and you want to double check and be sure that we've not left somebody off, or if you added somebody last year that, um, you know, for a circumstance last year that you want to take off, um, again, I've got the list if you want to look at that, and we will be meeting Saturday morning at 8 o'clock. We will eat, of course. Um, there's a sign-up <laughs> sheet over there for breakfast if you want to um, come eat with us, and then we will assemble our fruit baskets, or really their bags, and we will deliver them after we get those assembled. So please make plans to come out and help us with this a ministry that we have been doing at least 49 years. So. <laughs> Longer than me, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> That's been a long time. Any other announcements? Good to see some old faces and some old faces. <laughs> Make yourself at home. And, uh, you know how to do it. Linda? Psalm 146. This is the help of people versus the help of God. Help from people is temporal and unstable, but help from God is lasting and complete. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. Do not put your trust in princes, in human beings who cannot save. When their spirit departs, they return to the ground. On that very day, their plans come to nothing. Blessed are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God. He is the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. He remains faithful forever. He upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. <coughs> the Lord sets prisoners free. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the foreigner and sustains the fatherless and the widow. But he frustrates the way of the wicked. The Lord reigns forever. Your God, O Zion, for all generations. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. <coughs> a prayer. Those things that, of course, will be a special view and I'll leave us as we pray. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your lovely day. It's cool outside, Father, but it's so warm inside the fellowship with your people. Thank you, Father, for the sunshine and the rain for us. Opportunity, Lord, to come to realize that you're the creator and the one who made us all. Father, we thank you for your wonderful love. Most especially seeing the love of your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father. Now, the time of prayer, we want to ask you, Father, to be with all these on the prayer list, these we mentioned today. The various needs, Father, spoken and unspoken. Thank you once again for being a great person, being a great and gracious God, loving God, merciful God. <coughs> Father, we know that you always want the best for your people, so we, so again, feel so very comfortable and confident leaving these in your hands and asking your will to be done. We do pray for our country. We pray, Father, for the things that are taking place now. We just believe, Father, that Father, there will be some sort of a, a turnaround, maybe a moving back towards that type of country, Father, we believe that you desire for us. We pray for all of our leadership. We pray, Father, that they might find in you that they need day by day to be the leaders they're supposed to be making decisions for us, Father, and we're glorified to be able to do. Thank you once again. Just a Father, for the opportunity to come to worship. You know that around our world, this is not an easy thing for me to do. Thank you for the freedoms we enjoy. Thank you just the fact that we live in a, a country, Father, where it's okay to do what we do. And I just praise you and glorify you in our own way. Take charge of our day. We thank you once again for what you are going to do in our lives. And just pray, Father, as we leave, and we'll leave your minds and our spirits with you, Father, and the knowledge of where you want us to be. We love you. Thank you for your, again for your forgiveness and your direction and your guidance. We ask these things in Christ's name. And that's what the Lord is saying. Amen. 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 <coughs> All right, it's so good to see everybody this morning. Let's um, stand, and we're going to appropriately praise him this morning by singing praise him, praise him. <coughs>
16 and 1 through 8. And if you would, and if you are able, would you stand as we read this? This is the parable of the persistent or perseverant widow. And God's word says this. And he told them, he being Jesus, told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. He said, in a certain city, there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused, but afterward he said to himself, Though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice, so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge says, and will not God give justice to his elect, who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Father in heaven, God, I thank you for your word. What a gift it is. God, what a gift it is to gather with the body of believers and sing praises to your name. Lord, truly, there is no one like our God. And I was reminded this morning of what a friend we have in Jesus. Yes. Yes. Lord, of what a privilege it is to carry all our needs and our hurt and our shame and our worry and our angst and all the weight of this world to carry those things to Him in prayer. God, I pray that today you would ignite uh, for those of us in this room who would honestly admit that we are just not where we want to be when it comes to our prayer life. Lord, in our talking with you, that you would ignite a fire and a passion in us that cannot be quenched. God, give us a supernatural expectation for what you might do through prayer. Oh, Lord, what if we all in this room believed the things that you said about prayer? God, how would our own lives change? How would the, our families change, this community? God, how would this country change if your people believed what you said in your word about prayer? God, help us to make one step uh, towards that belief this morning. Lord, be with us. Uh, let my words be your words. Let them be filled with the Spirit. Lord, let them land on soft uh, and respondent hearts. Lord, we love you. Help us. God, help us to love you more and to look more like your Son when we walk out those doors today. It's in his beautiful and holy name I pray. Amen. 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 All right, you can go ahead and grab a seat. <laughs> So Luke 18, 1 through 8. Uh, and this is a parable uh, and to give us a little understanding of what's going on in this conversation. Jesus is uh, doing what he spent the vast majority of his time doing with his disciples, which is talking about the kingdom of God. He is discussing the kingdom with his disciples. And he's explaining to them that the kingdom is here. The kingdom is at hand. And yet it is not yet here in its full consummation. Uh, the disciples were in this moment living as we are in the middle, in the already but not yet. And the question that's going to sort of guide our time together today uh, is this. How are we to live in the middle? Uh, Jesus has come and he will come again. Now how do we live faithfully in the middle? And I think in our text we just read there really uh, are three things uh, that I want us to see as we seek to answer that question of how do we live as we wait. The, no, the first one is this, if you're a note taker. We should always pray. We should always pray. Verse 1 says this, And he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. Now, one of the pastors in a church I was previously at would always say something like this. Uh, he would tell us, I don't care that you read your Bible. He would say, I care how you read your Bible. Now, obviously, he wasn't saying that it's unimportant to read the Bible and you should never get in the Word. He was saying that there's a way to read your Bible that's probably going to be unhelpful uh, for your faith. One of the things is, growing up, all my teenage years, trying to figure out what, is, what does it look like to follow Jesus. Now, when I was sitting down for my once a month Bible reading at my house, when I started feeling bad about myself, uh, I would open my Bible and plop it open to whatever it fell on, read a few verses, get confused, 
and then walk away. And that was how I read my Bible. So what he's saying there is he, we want to read the scripture, but we want to read it right. Now. Can the Lord meet you if you just plop open your Bible? Yes. But is that the most helpful way? Probably not. And there's a way to read even our parable today that we can walk away uh, un, unhelped from what we read. And the thing we need to know is that the right reading of a parable is so important to rightly read a parable. The right reading is generally this. It's going to be the most simple reading of the parable. Uh, we should not get lost in the details or the weeds. A parable is always trying to teach us one main banner lesson. There's one thing to walk away with from a parable. And yes, the characters and the small details, they will support this message. Uh, but they are not the main thing. There's one lesson to walk away with. And I think every now and then, uh, I think only twice in the Gospels, Jesus clearly says the lesson that he was trying to teach in the parable. And verse 1 again says this, And he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always pray and not lose heart. So the lesson this parable is teaching us is to always pray and to not lose heart. This parable is teaching us perseverance in prayer. And the first side of this double-sided coin of perseverance is Jesus says two words. We should always pray. And he communicates this to his disciples through the story of a widow and an unjust judge. And these characters are very important to this lesson. The fact that Jesus chooses a widow and an unrighteous judge who fears neither God nor man is no coincidence. Uh, it is not random. If there's anyone in, uh, in this culture and in this time who should not expect justice, who would that be? The widow. And if there is anyone who has... Uh, nothing to offer, no political influence, no pull. It was the widow. Right. Right. And conversely, if there's anyone who would not feel any burden whatsoever to bring about justice in this widow's life, it would have been an unjust judge who the text says fears neither God nor man. The widow has no reason at all to expect anything, and the judge has no reason at all to concede. Jesus chooses these characters to communicate that in this scenario, justice, right, or the granting of the widow's request, is unlikely. Uh, and yet the one thing that this nameless and defenseless widow has going for her, in the midst of a culture that preys on widows, in the midst of a culture that widows would often fall victim to the legal system, <laughs> this widow had perseverance on her side. Uh, perseverance to such an extent that even this godless judge who has no reason to grant a request eventually relents and gives her justice. And it's in this parable that me and you find an outline for our own prayer life. Uh, now let me be clear. God is not an unjust judge. And we are not a nameless, uh, faceless widow. And we certainly don't pester God for our answers. Uh, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. But for now, this parable is calling us to have the same attitude as the widow, which is an attitude of persistence and perseverance. Right. Uh, this is a continual bringing your request before the Lord. Step one of a fruitful prayer life is always this. Show up. You have to show up. Right. And this parable would teach us that uh, not only is it okay, but encouraged that we show up again and again and again with the same request to God. And I don't think it's helpful for us to have this idea that uh, to talk about the same things over and over and over in God somehow communicates that we have an unhealthy prayer life. If there's anything that communicates intimacy with another person, it's that we talk about the same things over and over and over again. Yeah. If I have a conversation with a stranger, who knows what we're going to speak of? But I know a certain few people uh, at my church at Enon, if I walk up to them, I can about tell you what we're going to talk about. That's because we have relationship. Right. We've talked before. There's intimacy there. Right. We know each other. We have done a certain amount of life together. Speaking of the same old things over and over, that doesn't mean that intimacy is lacking. It means that it is present. Even Jesus. Uh, in prayers to his father, would say multiple times, would you please take this cup from me? Yeah. It wasn't as if Jesus thought that God the Father didn't hear him, or there was no 
intimacy there. It's precisely because of the relationship that he brings the same request over and over again. Another example would be Paul, who prays multiple times that the Lord would take away the thorn in his flesh. It's because he knows God that he prays again and again and again. Perseverance in prayer. Bringing your needs before God again and again is modeled and it's expected of those who follow Jesus uh, in this sin-sick world. Uh, and yet I think it's important that we're very clear on what persevering prayer is not. Persevering prayer is not an attempt to pester God into answer. Persevering prayer is not an attempt to win God over by the quantity or the eloquence of our words. Per uh, persevering prayer is not because God is ignorant or uninformed or forgetful. It's not like that, that grandpa that just watches TV and never listens. You keep having to hit him and say, hey, are you hearing me? Are you listening to me? That's not who God is. Persevering prayer is not an attempt to soften a hard-hearted God. You're not trying to woo him over and show him all the facts and a beautiful PowerPoint of exactly why it would be beneficial if he would just say yes. Persevering prayer is not a performance of faith, zeal, and holiness in hopes to impress God. If we enter into prayer in hopes to woo God and impress Him to say yes, uh, then we're missing the point of why we do this. One commentator says this, We persevere in prayer not because we have not yet uh, gotten God's attention, but because we know He cares and He will hear us. We persevere in prayer because perseverance communicates faith. Perseverance communicates faith. To ask anyone for something one time is a shot in the dark. Now, I've used this illustration before. If I walk to every single person in this room and I say, can you give me $200,000? <laughs> That's a shot in the dark. But if I find out who is the biggest tither in this place, and then I ask them over and over and over again, what is that communicating? I know you have it. So I'm going to ask you over and over and over again because you can do it. You have the resources to say yes. Perseverance in asking communicates faith. It communicates that you wholeheartedly believe that the person that you're asking can say yes. That they can come through. And we know that God honors. If there's anything that uh, the Bible, especially the Gospels, teach us. God honors the faith-filled prayers of his people. Amen. Still, one of the things that I read throughout the Gospels that surprises me every time is the way that God will see some Jesus, will see someone, and he will say that he marveled at their faith. How in the world the God and creator of the universe who owns everything that I can point at would somehow marvel at something we could do? But man, what would it look like if God looked at us and said, wow, look at their faith. Look at their faith. So why should we always pray? Because perseverance in prayer communicates faith. It communicates that we know the person that we are praying to has the resources to say yes. Amen. To say yes. Number two, if you're taking notes, we should not lose heart. We should not lose heart. Again, parables have one big banner lesson or main teaching. And often that lesson is fleshed out uh, through the story and the parable itself, yes, but it's also, uh, as I said, fleshed out through the characters. And it's often that uh, we learn the lesson through comparisons and contrast with the characters that were given. And this parable is no difference. The lesson, the banner over this lesson, over this parable, is perseverance. But the true hope of this parable is found in the contrast and the characters. In this story, the needy person, which is us, uh, is a defenseless widow. And the one she needs something from is an unrighteous <laughs> and unjust judge. We learn from this widow that it was her persistence to ask that eventually brought her reward. It was her continual petition that brought her justice. But the hope for us in this parable is not found uh, necessarily <laughs> in identifying with the widow. Yes, we are the needy person. But we are not in the same position with God as this widow was with the judge. Right. And God is certainly not to be, to be identified with the unjust and unrighteous judge. No. Uh, it's actually just the opposite. A lot of parables fall into the category of how much more? How 
how much more? And the lesson of this parable is if an unjust judge eventually relents and gives justice to someone who he has no regard, no care for, how much more will a loving and generous God delight in saying yes to his own sons and daughters? Amen. If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Amen. And verse 6 and 7 says this. And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge says. And will not God give justice to his elect? Or you can read that. How much more does God delight in giving justice to his elect? Who cry to him day and night. Will he delay long over them? I think the lesson of this parable one aspect of it can be summed up like this. Why should we always pray? Because he can. Right. Why should we always pray? Because he can. But here's where the switch happened. And here's where uh, the beautiful lesson of this parable begins to take shape. Why should we not lose heart? Because he's willing. Amen. It's one thing to have the power to say yes. It's another to want to say yes. Why should we always pray? Because he can. Why should we not lose heart? Because he is willing. This is the difference between a powerful God and a good God. Mm -hmm. A God who is all powerful but who is not good is nothing more than scary. But our God has all the power and all the resources and all the love and all the affection and all the desire to say yes. A powerful God can, but a good God wants to. I wonder how much our prayer lives would change for the better uh, if we actually believed that the one we're praying to was willing to answer and that he desired to say yes. What if we believe the truth of Psalm 84, that he withholds no good thing from those who love him? I love this quote from Tim Keller. He says, in our prayers, we can trust that God will either give us what we ask for or he will give us what we would have asked for if we knew everything that he knew. Yeah. That's good. He's either going to say yes, or he's going to say no. I have something better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think Jesus includes this encouragement to not lose heart, uh, most simply because he knows that there will be reason for us to lose heart. Uh, if there's anything that I'm learning about myself is that I'm very... Uh, very tempted to often lose heart uh, and sit in discouragement. But praise God that Jesus offers encouragement to those who are discouraged, to the weary and the weak. He knows that we are often prone to do just that. Uh, and when we don't see the fruit of our prayers in our time, we can be very tempted to give up. One of my favorite uh, miracles in the Gospels is when Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. I love it for the obvious reasons, the reasons it's most normally preached on is, man, that's a Jesus moment, right? He stands before the grave and he calls him out. And you can just hear the, uh, the bass and the baritone in his voice calling, Lazarus, wake up, come out of that grave. And that's a, I'm going to hold my shoulders back and I'm, I'm pumped up when Jesus does that. Right? That's a great moment. Uh, but I think one of the most beautiful things that we often miss uh, in the story of Jesus and Lazarus is what happens before that. Uh, it's one of my favorite because it does a good job of answering some hard questions that we all <coughs> wrestle with at one point or another, which is this. Why hasn't he answered my prayer? Why hasn't he said yes? Uh, the story of Lazarus gives me a place to turn when I'm confused uh, or even frustrated, which is okay. Frustrated with uh, my misunderstanding of what the Lord is doing in the background. Mm -hmm. uh, we love the end of this story, right? We love to see Jesus be Jesus and raise Lazarus from the dead. But we often miss out on the front end uh, and the lesson that comes with it. The thing that we miss out on is that Mary and Martha didn't want Jesus to raise Lazarus from the dead. They wanted Jesus to heal him. Because he wasn't dead when they sent for him. He was ill. He was sick. They didn't want resurrection. They wanted healing. But the 
hard part about this story, the thing that we have to wrestle with, with the person of Jesus, is this. That when Jesus hears that Lazarus is ill, and he hears that Mary and Martha are heartbroken and crying out for help, he does not rush to their side, and he does not heal Lazarus. Um, he does not heal Lazarus. The text actually said that he purposely stayed away. He purposely did not come to heal Lazarus. So the question we're left with is obviously this. Why would Jesus do that? Uh, in our understanding of love, that doesn't sound very loving. In all our Marvel superhero understanding of who a hero is, when the hero hears of trouble, he doesn't stay away. That's not what a hero is in our mind. That's not what love is in our mind. To love someone is not to let them die when you know that you can help. Uh, but praise God. Uh, that Jesus leaves nothing up to our imagination. And he says clearly this line. He says, this illness is for the glory of God. Right. This illness is for the glory of God. Jesus makes it clear that the most loving thing that he could have done in those circumstances was not to heal Lazarus, but to let him die in order to display his glory. I love this quote. Uh, John Piper talks about this passage. He says this, So what is love? What does it mean to be loved by Jesus? Love means giving us what we need most. And what we need most is not always healing, right. but a full and endless experience of the glory of God. Amen. Love means giving us what will bring us the fullest and longest joy. Amen. And what is that? What will give you full and eternal joy? The answer of this text is clear. A revelation to your soul of the glory of God. Of God, seeing, admiring, and marveling at and savoring the glory of God in Jesus Christ. Love is doing whatever you have to do to help people see and treasure the glory of God as their supreme joy. To help people see and be satisfied with the glory of God. And I tell that story to say this sometimes, often, uh, the Lord will say, No. The Lord says no, and that can be discouraging to not have your prayers answered how you would like them answered, even when it makes perfect sense. Lord, what would bring, in my mind, reading that story, what would bring Jesus more glory in that story but to heal Lazarus? But we know that raising him from the dead brings them far, brings him far much more glory and strengthens the faith of all three of them far more than healing would have ever done. Amen. Here's the hope that we can cling to. Uh, even in the midst of confusion and frustration and prayers that have gone unanswered for years, we can trust that the Lord never withholds what is best. Right. And sometimes what is best is for Him to say yes to exactly what you're praying for. And sometimes what is best is for Him to say no for the sake of showing you more of His glory. Yeah. Our God never promised that he would be a God that we can perfectly understand. He promised He promised to be a God that we can perfectly trust. Even when it may not make sense. <coughs> Jesus says we are to always pray because we have faith that he we are to not lose heart because we have faith that he is willing and that he always gives us what's best. Amen. Amen. Uh, point number three as we close. Will he find faith? Verse 8 says this. I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? And the answer to that question, will he find faith when he returns? It depends on if he will find his people praying. Uh, those of great faith are those who persist in prayer. This is not a part of my notes, but I just love it. Uh, and recently read this. Uh, I was reading a book about prayer, and it talked about a woman named Monica. Uh, and Monica uh, had a rebellious son. Uh, she lived in uh, the Mediterranean Sea. Is the north of Africa or the south? North. She lived in northern Africa, had rebellious.
rebellious son uh, had wanted nothing to do with Jesus or the church or anything, prayed for him year after year after year after year. And there's all these crazy stories of what's going on with Monica and her son. And he just runs away from God uh, with everything in him. Uh, and at the very end, I love this. Uh, the author just knows how to create a climax. Uh, he says, and eventually, Monica's son did come to know the Lord. Uh, and his name was Augustine. And he just talks about all the things that Augustine did for the church uh, yeah. and for Jesus and for the theological study as a whole. And it's just this one mama praying for her son year after year after year after year. Uh, turns into one of the greatest theologians that the world has ever known. Uh, that's free. That's not in my notes. That, but what, uh, what an experience of the power of prayer. Uh, mm -hmm. So I don't know you all very well. Uh, but I do know this. In a room of this many people, there's probably someone in here with a wayward child. And I'll just say this. As someone who has no children, it's easy for me to encourage you because I've been walked through it. <coughs> and I don't have to. But the Word of God would encourage you with this. Stay faithful in prayer. Stay faithful in prayer. But point number three, as we close. Will we find faith on earth? Uh, those of great faith are those who persist in prayer. So what I want to do uh, as we close is give us a few practical tips and encouragements uh, to see that we always pray and, and we don't lose hearts. So if you're a note taker, I have four simple things uh, that I want to talk to that hopefully uh, will encourage us uh, in our prayer life. Number one is this. As we pray, we should do this. Befriend silence. Befriend silence. If you're not comfortable with being quiet, and what I don't mean is just the world around you is quiet. Some of you are young mamas. Your world is never going to be quiet. <laughs> if you are not comfortable with quietness in and of yourself, right. if you can't sit alone with yourself, you're not going to persevere in prayer. If you can't focus on one thing for more than five minutes, you're not going to persevere in prayer. I've never met anyone whose screen time on their iPhone is really high, and they're also really good at prayer. <laughs> If we can't focus on one thing uh, for a long amount of time and sit alone with God and sit alone with ourselves and all the ugliness that that brings, Amen. then we're not going to persist in prayer. One pastor says, solitude is the furnace of transformation. Solitude, silence in solitude is the furnace of transformation. Or as Psalm, as Psalm 46 says, be still and know that I am. Be still and know that I am God. Rarely is God loud. And if we can't befriend silence, we're going to miss out on what he's saying. Number two, uh, and when I heard this, these are not mine. I heard these from another pastor. When I heard this, it's like a monkey was taken off my back. He said this, normalize boredom. Normalize boredom. Prayer is most often uneventful. Most often prayer is going to be uneventful to expect that prayer is always going to be eventful and be fun and feel good and warm and you're going to hover over your, uh, your carpet in your room. That's just not true. That's just not the case. Uh, sometimes will the Lord meet you in your prayers in a special way? Will it feel exactly like that? Yes. That is not the norm. More often than not, prayer is going to be uneventful and that's okay. The Lord loves to show up and do miraculous things in a moment of time. But it seems like more than that, he really enjoys. As much as it may frustrate us, the Lord really enjoys the long game. Yeah. Uh, is Bible reading and Bible study always the most exciting and fun thing in the world? Yeah. No. Is it sometimes? Yes. Mm -hmm. But is it always? No. But is it always good? Yeah. Is it always shaping you and molding you into the image of Christ? Yeah. Yes. Amen. And prayer is the same. The Lord is playing the long game with your prayers. And sometimes uh, the long game is uneventful. Number three, reframe distractions. Reframe distractions. As a human, we will get distracted. Especially as a human entering into the spiritual warfare that prayer is. Of course the devil has something to gain if he can distract you in your moment of prayer. But I want you to hear this. Distraction does not mean that you are bad at prayer. It means that you're human. It means that you're human. I heard a pastor say this once, and I love it. He said, if I get distracted 
100 times in 10 minutes of prayer, that's 100 opportunities for me to come back to Jesus. Yeah. And how much does he honor that? Lord, I'm sorry. I got distracted. Meet with me here again. Meet me with grace. Lord, I got distracted again. Here I am. Here I am. Don't get discouraged by your distractions. Reframe them. Use them as an opportunity to come before the Lord over and over and over again. All right, let me leave, leave you with this last one as we close. And this is less of a tip uh, and more of an encouragement more than anything. Number four is this. Everyone is a beginner in prayer. Yeah. Everyone is a beginner in prayer. Prayer is not a performance. You don't master prayer. You labor at it. You work at it. There's no such thing as people who are good at prayer and people who are bad at prayer. The only difference is people who pray and people who don't. I say that to say it's okay. And I am reminded of this every single time I pray. That every time is going to feel like the first time. And that's okay. And that's okay. You don't master it. You labor at it. So don't be so hard on yourself. Uh, and the closing question. In today's passage... Uh, is the same question that we have to wrestle with in our own hearts and minds and in our own walks with Christ. When the Son of Man returns, will he find faith? And his question implies that the answer will be no unless we are faithful to pray and to not lose heart. Amen. So let me close this out with a word of prayer and then I believe we have uh, one final song. Father in heaven, we love you. God, what a gift. I pray you would never fall fall on cold ears and cold hearts. Lord, that we get to talk with you. And you are a God who wants to talk with your people. What a gift of your grace that is. God, would you remind us of that. God, would you remind us that as the weight of the world that seems to so often push us down, it seems like every person in this room always is just drowning in whatever their thing is. God, as the weight of the world pushes us down, help us to know that we have a place that we can take these worries and these anxieties. God, that you love to hear from your children. And more so than that, you love to say yes. And you love to give us more joy. God, I pray that for each person in this room, they would have a deep, embedded, gut-level belief that you are more invested in their life and in their joy than even they are. God, and I pray that you would make us a people who pray. God, knowing that we cannot handle these things on our own, under our own power, our own strength. But praise God that you have all the resources and you delight in saying yes. Lord, we love you. We thank you for Jesus. I pray for anyone in this room who may not know your son Jesus. God, that today would be the day. They would know that the blood of Christ covers their sins. God, and they are welcome to the throne of grace by the blood of Jesus. Lord, we love you. Help us to look more like your son and to love him more. And more than anything, Lord, help us to bring our requests before you again and again and again. God, help us to have faith that you are who you say you are. Lord, that you will answer with a yes or a no. I have something better. In your son's beautiful name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Always good to know prayer is good. Prayer works. Just need to do it. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you stand. And I don't have any idea, to be honest with you, what's going on after this. Must be something downstairs. And uh, you certainly invited to come on down there and be part of it. Mm -hmm. and thank you for presence today and luck coming. It's a, good, it's a good day to be a Christian, a good day to be a part of God's family, to be in his hands, to know that uh, he's there. He's here as, uh, as well. It's uh, 2022 will be a better year. We'll give God our best. Do I do that again? I'm not sure what else you're talking about, but I know it has something to do with it. Let's have a moment. Let's have a moment of prayer. Pray and skip the.
And I thought he did a good job. Mm -hmm. Fantastic job. Uh, but I'm going to ask Steve Loggins back there in a minute to play for us. See, I don't have Well, we got something we're going to do before that. Everybody have a seat, please. Well, see, I told you what was going on. <laughs> very obvious. Very obvious. Church has a following plaque. We'd like to present to our pastor. So we can only say that for a while, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> we love you, brother. Here's what it said. With our greatest appreciation, Liberty Baptist Church presents Pastor Willard Davis with this award in recognition for your 42 years of service. And for your faithful dedication to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. to Liberty Baptist Church, and to our community. We are indeed thankful for your true servant's heart.